so to give a little bit of context, I'll actually share my face for a, a moment. Um, so my name is Scott Swaley. Uh, I have a um, relatively diverse background that makes this kind of thing um, right in my wheelhouse. So I'm going to share real quick um, a little bit about that just to give you some context um, of where I'm coming from. So you should be able to see this little guy here. So let me present. Zoom always puts things in the way. Here we go. So um, starting off, uh, I have a background um, in everything from um, the technical side as an electrical engineer. I'm a halfway decent mechanical engineer, programmer, carpenter, machinist, kind of fill in the blanks. Um, and one of the things that that kind of allows me to do is work in these kind of cross-disciplinary spaces. And so just as a, a quick example here, uh, when I used to be actually an educator also, <laughs> I ran uh, shops and kind of STEM education for almost 10 years in public and private schools. Here are a few of the organizations I've worked with. Uh, you might have also seen my programs featured in these two documentaries. Um, and so um, I, I have been around a while, we have been doing this. And now um, I have a few roles. Uh, my main job is I am the founder and CEO of Make Safe Tools. We make safety equipment for uh, labs, makerspaces, industrial shops. Uh, I also do still work with education. So if you want to see some example projects, things with kids, check out gritlab.com um, or PBL Consulting. Um, I'm also on the board of Project Invent, which is a, um, a nonprofit that works with students all over the country to do a user-centered design. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive into the rest. Um, for uh, context, people that want to go more technical after this, right after this at 1.30, like literally I'm jumping straight to it, is another presentation called um, Lessons Learned in Designing High Power Line Voltage Circuits. So that's like a much more technical version of this. We'll be diving into triacs and voltage control and a whole bunch of things. So if this is interesting, that would be the next step. Um, and it's right after and I can uh, post those links into the chat so everyone has those. Um, and then ground rules for this, um, because I'm running this solo, please use the Q&A feature if you have a question and I'll try to kind of keep on top of that. Um, it's, a, it's a little hard to kind of see all of it when it's just me, but um, I will be watching for the Q&A. I probably won't see the chat or hand raises. Um, and this is all being recorded, I'll share it. Um, and there will be simulations as part of this uh, to make it a little more visual and I'll have those available too. Um, and then lastly, we are going to be talking about things that are that involve um, AC voltages, like things you would plug into the wall. So kind of if that's something that's new to you, do a little bit of research on the on the safety side. I'll talk about it a little bit here um, and always do um, two things. One, always use fuses on your circuits. So if something goes bad, it's not really bad. And secondly, never work on this kind of project with things still plugged in. So always make sure you unplug your equipment before you do any kind of modification. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and dive in. Um, and maybe this will be the only presentation you've ever seen in Falstad. Um, and for those that don't know, um, Falstad is an online circuit simulator that's free. It's all web-based, a little old school, but it really does a, um, a pretty good job. And so as we're um, going through all these things, you'll see me in this. I will share the simulation and you can access it. So I'm going to start with just a quick little bit of context so everyone can be starting from the um, same point on switches, um, just on specifically the different types of switches. So to start off, um, most people are familiar with what's called a single pole, single throw SPST switch. When you think about an on off switch, this is what it is, right? We have a little light here, switches off. When you turn it on, it turns on, right? Very straightforward. There's also momentary versions of that where when you click them, they only um, stay active as long as they're held down. So if you think about like a push button in real life, right? You hold it down to make something active, you release it to make it not active. Um, you can then get into things called a single pole double throw switch. So this is where um, some people are familiar, the terminology gets a little different. When we say single pole, we mean that there's basically one circuit it's working on. 
when we say double throw, we mean that it can go into one of two states, right? So it's a single pole that we can throw between one um, or two different areas, right? Turning on two lights, for example. And then you can kind of cascade this kind of terminology all the way up to where you have now a DPDT double pole, double throw. And this is um, the tr kind of terms you would use for shopping, whether you're shopping on Amazon or an electronic supply. And so as you're um, shopping for switches, this one would have two poles, right? Double pole. So we have a little small DC circuit down here lighting up an LED. We also have an AC circuit up here that's very high voltage and they are completely separate. So one of these advantages um, of having this separate pole is that you can have two separate circuits running that still react at the same time. So here we have these two kind of switches built into one. If this was a physical switch, a single press would uh, modify both of the circuits. So keeping that in mind, um, you could cascade that all the way up into like five pole, five throw. We're not gonna get into that. But I wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page there um, before we move into relays. So the advantage of a relay is that it is basically an electrical switch that could be single pole, single throw, like a basic on off. It could be double pole, double throw, and you can have all those different options. And the difference is that we can activate the switch electronically. And so a lot of people are familiar with transistors, right? It's a way you can, it's an electronic switch, fundamental part of computers. Um, a lot of people kind of know that concept. Um, and uh, this is a little more old school. I mean, relays have been around a hundred years. They've basically been around as long as electricity. Um, and so um, there's a few basic components to this. One is, and I'm gonna drag another screen in here just to show some pictures. Um, a relay, like most switches, is literally two pieces of metal that touch together to make electrical contact, right? That's the fundamental component, like in this cross-section of a relay. The only difference is, instead of you pressing that, it is brought together by a big electromagnet. So that project you did in high school where you wrap wire around a nail and it becomes a magnet, that's all this is. Um, and so by activating this electromagnet, electromagnet, it turns on that switch. So that's what a relay is fundamentally. And so our controls on a relay, kind of the things we have influence over, are um, the actual switch itself, when it, which in this diagram is a single pole, double throw. I'm not using one of the poles or one of the throws, so it's basically an on-off. And then we have this coil here. So this little wiggly on a circuit diagram means a coil or inductor. And um, I have a little battery here connected to a switch. And when I activate that, current flows through that coil, which made that switch move. So let me do that again. So when I activate that, it actually magnetically pulled that switch over, and now that AC circuit is working. The advantage of this is I can use very low voltage, very safe, very cheap parts on this side to activate what might be a very large load on this side. So this would probably be in the scale of milliamps, thousands of an amp. This could be up to anything, right? This could be running a city block. Um, and so relays really allow us to um, use small control signals to control big loads. You can also use them for logic. You can use them for basic um, and or functions. And you can go actually pretty far with that. And the advantage is that there's no programming here, right? You don't need to get an Arduino. You don't need to do anything. You're just wiring some basic parts together. So we're going to use this concept to walk through a couple um, different projects. And these are all very practical projects you can do in real life. Um, one we're going to look at is just using something like an Arduino, if you wanted to, to control a very big load. Another one is if you have a laser cutter or something like that, and um, you have an exhaust fan and you want the exhaust stand to automatically turn on when the laser cutter turns on. Or maybe you have a chop saw and you want your vacuum to automatically turn on when your chop saw turns on. Those are some ways you can use relays. We'll talk about that one. And then um, lastly, we'll do a real quick thing through um, how you can make a drill press safer. 
So uh, we could start, for example, with the um, this Arduino controlling a um, like a space heater in your living room, right? So this could be an IoT project. This could be a number of different things, um, and we basically have a very small sensitive piece of electronics over here that we want to interface with a very kind of powerful high voltage system. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the relay, which I left somewhere else on the page. Here it is. Um, so we're gonna take this guy and if it lets me grab it, we're gonna drag it over here and put this in the middle. And so this is a very similar circuit, and you're gonna be able to play with all these. I'm gonna make all this stuff available. Very similar circuit to what we were looking at a few minutes ago. So here on the left side, we have um, what's pretending to be an Arduino. Imagine this is a black box Arduino, right? And it's turning on and off for some reason. Um, and when it turns on, it's activating this switch. Now notice, it's activating this coil but it's not actually touching any of the switch parts. So what we can do now is for your space heater or your um, vacuum, whatever you have over here, we can wire it up so that switch is controlling it. And so, I might have done it backwards, we're gonna see in a sec. Yeah, so I did it backwards where it's, um, where it's turning off instead of on. So we'll go to the other one. And now when the Arduino has an on signal, it activates the coil, which closes a switch and runs our space heater, right? And so this is a way, when you get a signal from your Arduino or microcontroller or whatever it is, you can use that signal, even a very small signal, to drive a relay that does something very large on the other side. Um, and so that basic concept um, can be really useful. Now, there, there is a weird trick here, and I'm not gonna go into this in depth. I'll talk about it in my next uh, session if you are interested. Um, a, uh, the coil of a relay is what's called an inductor, um, and it, it does have an effect where it can kind of kick back and cause voltage spikes that can damage an Arduino. And so there's some ways to, to go around that that I, I'll talk about in more detail in the next thing. So here's just a quick example of how we, um, we did something with just a few wires that allowed us to take our Arduino or a simple switch and use it to control something very large. Um, a practical example of that could be that in your classroom or in your home shop, you have a laser cutter and an exhaust fan or a chop saw and a vacuum and you want them to work together. Um, and I have a question from Peter about the difference about a solid state relay. Um, I will talk about that more in my next session. Um, a solid state relay is actually a semiconductor, it's called a thyristor, um, and it is a completely different beast. Um, can function the same way as a black box, but I will talk about that more in my, in my next section. Um, and then for, uh, so, go, so going back to this real quick, we have, let's say, um, a laser cutter, which is operated by who knows what, and your exhaust fan. And so we would say, hey, we want this exhaust fan to turn on automatically whenever the laser cutter does. So what we would do is we would take, um, I'm gonna take the same kind of relay structure we had a second ago, drag it over here and say, um, for our exhaust fan, we're gonna use this as a switch. And so I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna connect the switching side of this relay to our exhaust fan. Now, we need some way that the laser cutter can activate the coil, right? Because putting current through this coil on this side is what activates it. Um, and so you can do that a number of ways. And to be clear, you can get relays with all kinds of coils. You can get relays that are made for um, different DC voltages in their coil. You can get relays that are made for different alternating currents in their coils. Um, and so you can really easily get whatever you need. Um, but for this example, we could do something as simple as, let's say, um, just wiring this up in parallel so that when 
our laser cutter has power. Now our exhaust fan has power. Now you might be wondering, why don't we just like connect those if they're both AC? Um, there could be a number of reasons. One is um, they could both be so big that they can't be on the same circuit. It could be that they're not physically located close to each other. Um, and to run wires between these, if this was on your roof, for example, you'd be running full current carrying wires all the way to your roof as opposed to very, very tiny signal wires. Um, or what we could even do on this, which, was, which makes it even a little easier, or maybe not easier, but a little um, more straightforward. And this is something I've done on laser cutters before. Um, a little more hacky, but it works. Is on a laser cutter, there will be um, some kind of DC power supply. And if you're lucky, you have to open it up. You can actually find a circuit in your laser cutter that um, turns on when it's cutting only. Um, and so that is some kind of power supply. And you can actually tap into that and use that to power your relay coil. And so um, I had the problem when I used to run Makerspace that the kids would forget to turn on the fans, right? And so that can cause fires and all sorts of problems with laser cutters. And so you, we basically wired it so that um, when the laser cutter was um, actually cutting, it activated the coil of a relay, which turned on our exhaust fan. And that was the way it just, it made it, idiot proof, right? It just turned on automatically whenever it had to. Um, and when we're trying to think about making things safe all the time, the best way to do it is to make it so um, we're not only relying on people's kind of observations and actions. We want it to be, as much to be automatic as possible. So that's a quick example of how you can get two things, whether it's a laser cutter and exhaust fan or something like a chop saw and a vacuum to kind of run together. Um, and I know I'm going through these fast. Um, uh, and then I'm going to talk really quickly about um, power tools. So when we have power tools, the basic gist of almost any power tool you buy is it is a motor, a basic switch, and you plug it in. There's not much to them. Um, and for some things, that's fine. But there's a couple problems. One is um, in maker spaces, we tend to have lots of equipment that's kind of all over the place, right? You might have a grinder that when you need it, you bring it out of the closet or the bandsaw that you have to roll outside when it's time to use it. And so we end up moving equipment around a lot. Now, let's say that, for example, where um, someone accidentally leaves this switched on, right? They're sawing or whatever. Um, let's say they blow a circuit breaker, right? So they blow a circuit breaker and we'll say, we'll, we'll say that that means, right? They blew a circuit breaker, right? Power's disconnected and they go, oh darn, what happened? and they run off and someone trips the circuit breaker back on and power returns, that tool is gonna turn back on, right? In the room by itself with hopefully nobody near it. Or let's say that when you're rolling the saw outside, right? It's obviously unplugged, right? You're rolling it outside and while you're rolling it, someone accidentally presses that switch, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then while somebody's setting up their work, somebody plugs it in, guess what? Your bandside just turned on and someone's hands were probably not where they should be. So this is actually called um, an accidental restart. This is something that in the industrial world is actually regulated to not be possible. Now, it doesn't mean people do that, but um, it is actually legally required in any workplace that any machinery cannot automatically restart itself. And so um, that is uh, kind of scary because the way tools come even brand new is they will naturally do this. They will naturally start themselves up um, and put everyone at risk. And so there's a way we can solve this with relays. Um, so we can do what's called a latching relay circuit. And I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna go through this one fast. So we've got um, a few things going on here in this diagram. Let's pretend this little lamp up here is our motor. We have um, our motor plugged in to a AC source, and it is being switched by this one pole of this two pole relay. Now down here, we have some other source, right? In this case, it's a battery. And when I press this, current flows into the coil and activates the um, our saw, right? Great, you're using the saw. 
But what's different about this is this is a momentary switch. So when I press it, it releases. And you'll notice that when I release it, the coil is still active. That's kind of strange, right? That might not be super intuitive. And so what we've actually done here is a few things. So I'm gonna turn it off. Oops, wrong one. So in this state, the way that you can get current to flow through this coil is either by letting it flow through this second hole or by pressing this button. Either one of those will activate the relay. But the cool thing is, if you activate that coil, coil via this switch, it then closes this relay, which lets it keep itself closed. So I'm gonna press this just really quick, right? Depress it, release, but now since it switched, it is latched into that position. That's why they call this a, um, a latching relay. And so that's something um, that's very, very common. It's just a few wires you add to any um, double pole relay and you can use as kind of a, um, a latch on circuit. Now you would also have a, you can have a switch over here to turn it off. But the advantage of this is that if you lose power or you unplug it, so let's say that um, we lost power here. Oops. So we lose power, power returns, it didn't start itself. It needs to be actively turned on again. And so that is um, something that's sometimes called a magnetic switch, sometimes low voltage dropout um, or a latching relay. And you can buy products that do this for you or you can make it yourself. And this is something um, running an industrial safety company and also having worked with um, all sorts of different maker spaces. It's a very inexpensive project that can do a lot to keep people safe. Um, and it's also just kind of a fun thing to learn about latching relays. It's a fun way uh, to kind of challenge people. Um, and just with a few switches and other relays, you can add even more functionality. For example, let's say that this was a key switch. Let's say you didn't want every kid ac accessing your, um, um, you didn't want every kid accessing your tools. Instead of just a push button, you could replace this switch with a key switch. So when you go over there, you can turn it on with your key, but then once they turn it off, it can't start again until you come back with your key, right? And so you can get creative with some very, very inexpensive parts. And so that in a nutshell is um, a few ways you can use relays. Now, using those terms, I talked about single pole, uh, single throw, single pole, double throw. You can buy these, I'm talking like a dollar maybe for um, relays, but I will say you do wanna be careful with ratings. So every relay will have a rating for the coil, right? What voltage is it expecting? And it will also have ratings for its contacts. Um, and its contacts are the switch part. And you always wanna make sure that they're rated for what you're planning to do. If you're planning to plug in a light to it that takes about one amp at 120 volts, make sure that your contacts are rated for one amp or more at 120 volts or more. Um, and then the last caveat is if you're running motors specifically or any inductive load, but motors especially, you wanna make sure that the relays you buy are rated for use on a motor because a motor is its own kind of thing that can be rough on relays. And you know that because it'll have an HP rating, horsepower. So if it says like one horsepower rated, you know that it's safe to use on a one horsepower or under motor. So um, that's the quick overview. I have one question I'll answer um, that I see. So resources on how to find that DC signal from a machine when it turns on, like you mentioned with a laser cutter. Yeah, so um, it depends on the machine. A, a power tool is not gonna have that signal. They're probably gonna have AC signals you have to work with. Um, but on a laser cutter or um, other kinds of equipment that have a kind of controls interface, what I will typically do is I will very safely open it up, um, look for things that might be, um, that look like contact points. Maybe there's a power supply you see, there's a few wires you see. And what I'll do is I'll take a multimeter and um, I'll have someone turn the machine on and 
and I'll check. Does that turn on when they turn it on? Nope, right, try the next one. Does that turn on when they turn it on? And sometimes you get lucky and there's a really easy one, um, like it, is it the case with most laser cutters. Um, sometimes you don't and you have to be a little more creative. Um, any other questions before we, uh, we wrap it up? I mean, do use that Q&A section if you have questions. So, oh, so Peter says he's seen a lot of uh, relays where the contacts go bad over time because of arcing. So I'm gonna talk about that a lot in my next session in just a few minutes. Um, the uh, short answer is that's people using relays that aren't rated for what they um, are using them for. And the number one reason is inductive load. So I was talking about with motors, that they, um, you wanna make sure they have uh, horsepower ratings. If you don't have a um, horsepower rating, what'll happen is when that relay tries to separate, right? There's two, there's two pieces of metal in that relay that at some point um, want to separate to uh, open the circuit. If it's an inductive circuit, like a motor, that circuit doesn't wanna open and it will fight by creating a, um, a high voltage. So that's going to actually pull apart and create basically a welding arc. Um, and that can destroy contacts instantly um, or slowly over time, depending on the load. So that's all for this quick one. Um, if you are uh, working in a shop, I do highly recommend um, you check out um, our website at Make Safe Tools. That's www.makesafetools.com. And as I mentioned, I am gonna be um, jumping into another session, which is a deeper dive into switching um, high power that's a little bit more technical. And so I'm gonna paste that link right now into the um, into the chat. Um, where is the chat? Here we go. Okay, so in the chat right now, you will shortly see. Come on, where chat go? Chat. There we go. So you will see a link in the chat right now. Um, it's entry 71723. You can also look up um, its title if you need to, which is Lessons Learned in Designing High Power Line Voltage Circuits. So one more time, grab that link before I shut down the meeting. Um, it is Lessons Learned in Designing High Power Line Voltage Circuits, and it's starting now um, on that other channel. So see you over there maybe. Uh, thanks for attending, and I'll email out um, the links and stuff for um, after that one. I'll email out the simulation and everything to everyone that registered. Thanks a lot.